I've seen some interesting responses around the room. Let's see if we can gather them together. Polar form on its own ends up being not dissimilar to rectangular in that you are about to substitute and then you're like, oh, oh, is that it? Right? What happens? You've got two things here, both being raised to the power of n. So therefore, you end up with an r to the power of n. And then all the rest of this thing also to the power of n. Do you, do you agree? And then we're kind of in exactly the same boat here as we were here. You're like, oh, a binomial. Don't want to expand that. We'll see what happens there. Okay. So I'm just going to pause at that moment. But when we come to exponential form, and we shouldn't be that surprised because it's a form named after what we're doing right now. This is exponentiation that we're exploring right now. Yeah. You end up with something a little more useful. What happens? Well, um, you get the same r to the n hanging out the front. Yes. But then because this is in index form, what happens when you raise something like this to the power of n? What do you do with that index? Yeah, you, you multiply those together, right? So I guess I could write it as e to the power of i n theta. You, you OK with that? Now, what I like about this is, go back to Friday's lesson. We proved a big bad formula that tells me what this thing means, right? Do you remember? I was named after a famous mathematician. His name was Leonard Euler, right? Swiss mathematician. And he proved something to do with e to the i x, right? What, what was that equal to? It should look really familiar to stuff we've written on the board, right? Say it again, louder. Cos x plus i sine x. Very nice. Cos x plus i sine x. By the way, um, we did that informal proof on Friday. Go and have a look at the Canvas page. You'll see the big, long formal proof that's there. I hope you get something out of that. Now, have a look at this, right? Is not this e to the power of i x for a particular value of x? What value of x is in here? What's the x that's? It's n theta, isn't it? That there is the x. So therefore, I can substitute it for this. All the x's, I'll substitute for a, an n theta. Does that make sense? So let's have a go at this. Maybe this is not where your line has gone, but I'd love you to follow with me. I'm now going to have this with n thetas instead of x's. Is that OK? So I'm going to get cos of n theta plus i sine of n theta. That double n looks a bit weird. Maybe put some brackets around it if you feel more comfortable. Yeah. Okay, does that look better to you? Okay. Now here's what we can do now. This is where we're sort of looking at this same object but from two angles, right? All of these are z to the n. They're all the same object, right? But if I call this guy, say, equation one, call this one equation two, this is just like simultaneous equations, right? I can equate these two and get an important result out of it. Let's write that down. If I'm equating 1 and 2, because they're both equal to z of n. Yes, you're following why I'm doing this? Uh, you can see you've got r to the n, and all of the stuff in here also to the power of n. And then you've got r to the n one more time, and then this which we got out of uh, Euler's formula. Now it looks to me like there's a big old common factor on both sides. What can I divide through by, left and right? Say it again, Nat. R to the power of n, right? It's common on both sides. So I could divide both sides by that. And that leaves me with a really important result, which is going to be our subheading. I told you I'd come back to it. If you just take the trigonometric terms and their powers, this formula that we just end up with, right? Uh, named after another mathematician, not Euler. This is a French mathematician named Abraham de Moivre. Now, I have found about 15 pronunciations for this guy's name on the internet. But I asked a French teacher, because we happen to have French teachers here, how do I pronounce this name? And she told me, de, that's the easy part, moi, like as in me, and then, well, the way it's spelled, vre, OK? Not de Moivre, like he's not Spanish, OK? Um, de Moivre's theorem, this thing down here, is phenomenally useful. And we're going to use it. We get handed this complex number, right? Let's jot it down together. We have z equals 1 plus, uh, I tend to like to write the i on the n. So 1 plus root 3, i. But i root 3 is the same deal, OK? Now what they want us to do, you can see the real question in part b is, raise this thing this thing here, to the 11th power. 
boy do I not want to do that in rectangular form. That's a bad idea. There's going to be 12 terms. Um, hopefully they will simplify out, but uh, that's, that's nobody's idea of a good time. So instead, you can see part A there sort of helpfully nudging us to say, maybe try a different form here, right? So part A, let's express this in mod arg form in polar form. What are the two things we need for mod arg form? A modulus and an argument. So let's go ahead, work out the modulus here. Uh, the modulus is Ed. I can get it from Pythagoras, it's going to be the square root of this squared plus this squared, right? 1 plus 3. So you're going to get... Yes, this is why I come to the extension 2 class. We can do arithmetic. Okay, so I've got a modulus now, okay? Now the next thing is I'm looking for an argument. Now Mrs. Lee's already talked before about um, principal arguments, so I just want to remind you we have these ever so slightly different pieces of notation for this. When you see that, arg z, right, it's like argument, angle to get to a point. Sometimes when we definitely, definitely want you to provide the principal argument, we'll capitalize the a, but it's a teeny tiny thing that you often miss, okay? Um, thankfully this guy's in the first quadrant anyway, so it's hard to miss the principal argument. How are we gonna get it? Well, we can say cos theta and sine theta off the basis of all the numbers in here. How will you combine the numbers you can see on the board to get cos theta? Which part is it? Have a think. You've got a, a horizontal and a vertical component. Which one's cosine? It's the, it's the first one, right? It's 1 over 2. Do you agree? Over the modulus. And then this leaves root 3 over 2. And we know the angle that does this, right? What's the argument that I'm after? It's going to be pi on 3. Fantastic. Pine 3. Got my modulus, got my argument, so I can say therefore z equals 2 cos pi on 3 plus i sine pi on 3. Happy times. <laughs> so that's our setup. As we go into part b, now they're saying, well, okay, can you raise this thing to the power of 11 and then return me back into rectangular form? That's where sort of we're heading, right? We started there, so we're going to end there, right? So when I go to part b, I don't want to use this original form, I'm going to use this form, right? But according to De Marvel's theorem, right, I can sort of do a lot of this legwork really easily, right? For starters, that modulus out the front, if you raise that to the power of 11, what you can get? Two to the power of 11, right? If you're a nerd like me, then you know two to the power of 10 is 1024, so the next one is 2048. Um, a few years ago, there was a game that was all... Anyway, doesn't matter. I'm showing my age. Um, that's my modulus. It gets huge because you're doing this over and over again. So you scale many, many times and you're enormous. Okay? According to De Marvel's theorem, I'm raising to the power of 11. So what happens to my angles? They get multiplied by 11. Okay? So instead of pi on 3, I'm going to have 11 pi on 3 plus I sine... 11 pi on 3. Now just like with Pythagoras, just like with Euler, anytime you invoke something you should say where it comes from. So I will state in here, right, by De Moivre's theorem. Bless you. Yeah. Is it necessary to, uh, when we are doing a question about like the Morpheus theorem, do we always need to say by the Morpheus theorem? So, um, do we need to quote this? Uh, let me answer that question by asking you another one. When you were in year 7 and 8 and you first learned about hypotenuses in right angled triangles, did you always have to talk about that ancient Greek mathematician every time you did a calculation? No. Answer? No. <laughs> really? In year 7 and 8? No. You should have when you were doing Pythagoras' theorem. This is explaining a few things to me now. Anyhow, I'm writing this here because you should be writing it, okay? Uh, especially because it's new, yeah. If we don't write it, we won't get marks. If you don't write it, what you are saying to me is, I'm not interested in clearly communicating the reasoning in my argument. And that may result in you losing marks. So I'm writing it because I think you should too. Now, you could, if you wanted, reach your calculator and do cos of 11 pi on 3. But before you do that, like, go and do that when you've tried this with your own brain and confirm that you got the right answer. Let's not go there yet. I've got 2048 out the front. I want you to think with me, right? The more you do this with your brain, the better your brain will get at doing it. 11 pi on 3 is this enormous angle, right? 
11 pi on 3 means you go round and round and round and round and round. But cos and sine, right? Cos and sine, because they go round and round and round, they're periodic functions. Do you remember that? They are periodic every, what's their period? How often do they repeat? Two pi. Two pi radians, right? So the closest multiple to this that I can think of would be 12 pi on 3. That'd be pretty close, right? So 12 pi on 3 forwards or backwards of this angle would be the same angle. Do you agree? Yeah. So instead, I'm going to, well, I'm going to subtract 12 pi on 3. That would give me negative pi on 3. Are you okay with that? Yeah. You see their equivalent, right? Yeah. Uh, I've got the same thing over here. Um, so I'm taking advantage of the periodicity of the trigonometric functions. And then because I'm so exceptionally lazy, I can go one step even better than that, right? 2048 still hanging out the front. Cos is not just a periodic function, it's, it's also a, a symmetrical function. It's yeah. even, yeah. right? So cos of negative anything is just cos of the same positive angle, right? So that's cos of pi on 3, which I already know, right? We've got this from the start. Um, here, sine doesn't have, it has symmetry, but not the same kind of symmetry. It's not an even function, it's odd. So therefore, this negative pi on 3, it can become a negative out the front. And I'm doing this again because I know what sine pi on 3 is. Does that make sense? Now, did you have to do this legwork in the question? No, but the more you do this, the better your brain gets at noticing these. And then when you do reach for your calculator, you'll know why you were correct. Okay, so I think we've got a half out here. We've got, what have I got? Root 3 on 2i. I'm not even going to write the next line because I reckon you can handle it. Those halves can factorize out. So you should leave, should leave you with 1,024 uh, minus 1,024 root 3 i. Maybe I will write that because that sounded longer than I'd like to remember. So 1,024 minus 1,024 root 3 I, there's my solution. Okay, so you can see how powerful something like DeMarva's theorem is. It just sort of makes mincemeat of questions like this.